y'all know y'all can't keep doing this to me, right? Because I'm going to think y'all got soul. <laughs> All right? Y'all can- <laughs> These brothers got soul. Miss Marsolier, I, you know, you, you made that keyboard jam. I closed my eyes and went to church. Not church, I went to church. Okay. Praise the Lord. It's nice having a choir back, boy. I love every minute of it. Praise God, praise God, praise God. <sighs> Let's get to work. It is Religious Liberty Sabbath. I don't like doing Religious Liberty stuff. I have avoided this topic for as long as I've been speaking. Um, But since Pastor Gary decided to go to an All About Jesus seminar, and since he gave it to me, and since I prayed about it, we're going to discuss it today. And I want us to open our eyes and ears to what God has for us today. I'm going to give you a different take on religious liberty from the Bible. And I'm going to show you how it ties in. I'm a storyteller, so I got to do it with stories. And I got to do it from the Bible. But there's one story I want to share first. Let's pray and let's get started. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us. I pray the same every time. It's your time, it's your place. It's your people, it's your building, it's your day. Lord, I am just a tool in your belt to be used as you see fit. Bless us today with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. One of the reasons I don't like this subject or conversation, whatever you want to call it, is because there have been times where I have been to pulpits around the West Coast and it's been religious liberty Sabbath and Agendas get pushed, not Jesus. And I don't like that. If you have a different opinion than me, that is your right. If you have a different perspective than me, I understand. I don't have to make you see mine in order for us to be friends. I like other opinions and worldviews because it makes it opens my horizon. This man and I have had some great conversations about America. Very small, short but he opened my eyes because I've never been out of this country before. He has. And so when he speaks and I listen, I said, huh, never thought of it that way. I had to go back home and take a look at some things. I enjoy this, but I don't want the pulpit where I'm in to be used to push an agenda. I only want to speak Jesus. So today I'm going to share with you some of the ways that how easily things can become divisive up here. And I shared this story in first service with the person sitting there. I had their permission. I knew they were man enough for me to share the story. Let me show you how quickly things can go sideways. Sunday, I had a men's ministry meeting at a friend of mine's house. There was four or five of us. We were friends, okay? I want to reiterate that. We were and are friends. I went to their house, and two of them have served in the United States military. I've never served. I'm the son of someone who served. And they were talking about their service. And I was quiet because I have no input on this subject. I'm quiet. I'm listening. And they were going back and forth about their branches of military and their service. And my friends started talking about another branch of the military and made a joke, but then kept egging on about they, how they didn't know how this branch of the military ever got into the military because all they did was sit on their boats. Obviously, these were infantrymen, and they were talking about the United States Navy. And I sat there quiet because how could these men know that one of the greatest men that I've ever known, my father, was a 25-year Navy veteran. And they were disrespecting his service. But they're my friends. And I choose to trust the hearts of my friends. So I'm not offended by it. I didn't even say anything about it. I didn't even bring it up. It's not even a topic of discussion. They're my friends. But can you imagine how if I was not a follower of Christ, how that conversation could have went sideways. 
How dare you disrespect my father? That's all it would have took, and the argument's on. Or I could have kept in my heart that these horrible guys disrespected my dad, and it's on. Our perspective and our conversation sometimes can be divisive, and we think that everybody thinks or feels like we do, and they do not. Now, take that same conversation and turn it to politics. All of a sudden, we got a church divided. And I don't like that. Not with my friends, not with my family. I don't let things come in between me and my friends because I don't use that word lightly. If, if I call you my friend, it's because I've chosen that you're my friend. And I don't care what you do. I'm going to be friendly toward you because you're my friend. That's how I've been friends with guys with swastikas on their neck, Aryan Nation tattooed on their back. That's how I've been friends with guys with the Proud Boys tattooed on their hands. Because I chose to be your friend. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm a big boy. If I choose to be friendly towards you, what are you going to do about it? I don't like you. That's okay. I love you still. I got family members who didn't like me. That don't hurt my feelings at all. We have to be better than this. So in order to have you understand what our job is, I want to take you somewhere in the Bible. I want you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33 for me, please. I did a devotional on this earlier this week, and I'm going to give you, I'm sorry, my sister just texted me that my dad served 33 years in the Navy, not 25. I was corrected. My bad. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> sorry, sis, I didn't mean to offend. My father was 33 years. My bad. I want to take you to Exodus chapter 33, and I'm going to read from the NIV because I want to, Exodus chapter 33, okay? We're going to start at verse 1, and then we're going to skip down. But I want you to see, let's, let's build the story real quick. God has freed Israel from Egypt's clutches. He's taken them through the Red Sea. They're in the forest, and now they're at Mount Sinai, and at Mount Sinai, it goes bad. Moses gets called up to the mountain to speak with God, and apparently he's been gone for a long time, so the people decide that he must be dead. So they decide, in their infinite earthly wisdom, to make a golden cow baby and worship it. And God is on top of the mountain with Moses, looking down at this nonsense that's happening at the foot of the mountain he is on. And he gets upset, not because they made a golden cow baby, golden calf. They, didn't even, they couldn't even be respectful enough to make a bull. They made a golden baby cow. Because when they made the calf, they said, now this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. After all he had done, this is what you say? It would have been like my children coming to my house. And my friends are inside the house, and they walk up and hug another man and call him daddy. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. After all I've done in stepping up to the role that I created, I'm dad. Not going to call somebody else dad. So the Lord says to Moses, after Moses comes down and breaks the Ten Commandments, rallies the Levites to himself, they run through and kill everybody that's out there partying and dancing. Everybody that's in their way, they come back. God is severely disappointed with his people. The Levites were separate now from them. And I want you to read the first line of Exodus chapter 33. The Lord says to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought out of Egypt. See, it... it, it, it <laughs> You have to understand God chooses words very carefully. Who brought them out of Egypt? It was God. So he's already distancing himself from these stubborn, stiff-necked people. Oh, you don't want to be my people? Fine. Moses, take these people you brought out. He's already distancing himself because the promises of God are not for those that are not with him. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That promise is for those that are with him. Of course he'll never leave you nor forsake you because the question isn't, God, are you with me? The question is, am I with God? 
I go where he goes. The devil worshippers sacrificing their children on the altar to a false god. God isn't standing there going, I'm with you. No. The promise is for his people. And since you are choosing to not be my people, I'm distancing myself from you. Let's read on. He says, go to the land I promised on oath. I'm giving this to you because I swore it to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And as we said before, it wasn't good to be an ite in the Bible. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. You ever have your parents come to you and say, get out of my face or something bad happened to you? I'm trying to save your life. Get out of my face. Get out of my face. Okay? You knew when mama called your full name you were in trouble. You knew when you walked in a room and her fingers were tapping you were in trouble. You knew that when she was closing her hands and her nails were digging into her own wrists, call for your father. Death is imminent. She's trying not to choke you. Okay? You knew this. God says, get out of my face. I'm not going with you because I'm, my presence alone would kill you. You're not my people. You're not acting like my people. You've chosen not to be my people. You're acting up. I can't handle this. Go. I'm only sending this to you because of a promise I made. Go. Verse 4 says, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord has said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israel stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. And then right between 7 and 11, there's this interlude. This interlude in the story that goes back to why Moses had this relationship with God that no one else had. Moses used to go to the tent of meeting, and, and I talked about this in the devotional. He had this relationship with God that no one else had. No one in the Bible can brag like Moses can brag about the relationship he had with Jesus. The Bible says that anyone, verse 7, Second part, anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp, yet no one else is recorded ever being there except for Moses and Joshua. And the weird thing about that is because those were the current leader and the next leader of Israel. So in my estimation, when I'm reading this, I say, oh, well, what qualifies you for leadership? He does. Not your education, not your pedigree, not your background. The only one that qualifies you for leadership is him. And if you want to be a leader, you had best be following him. Or else you're not a leader. You're just a guy with, what do they call it? Clanging cymbals, loud brass. But I want to skip ahead. Verse 12 says, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Now this echoes to the first time that Jesus and, or, or, or God, Jesus, and Moses met at the burning bush. At the burning bush, God, the very first thing he says is, I will go with you to Pharaoh. But in chapter 4, Moses says, you have not told me who you're sending with me. And that's how Aaron, his brother, got sucked into this situation. Because Moses looked at God and said, uh, I know what you said, but you're not enough. I need, some, I need some help. Now, here, towards the end of their relationship, the end of Moses' life, I should say, here on earth, Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this is, nation is your people. He picked up on what God said, and now he's pleading, God, listen, you and I have an intimate relationship. You know my name. I know you know everybody's name, but you know my name like that. See, it's, it's kind of that intimate, like, <laughs> 
I'm going to pick on my friend here again. Mr. Marsolier may or may not, I'm not in their house, have a pet name for his wife. He may say baby. Baby's a common name. Baby. It would be weird if I walked up to his wife and said, hey, baby. <laughs> he said, no, you ain't doing that. <laughs> right? He knows her name like that. I don't know her name like that. I know her as the great Miss Marsoli Mrs. Marsolier. I don't know her name as baby. That's him. God says, I know your name. I know it intimately like that. So he says, if you know my name, God, and I have found favor with you like you said, remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replies something. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, this is good. Moses is like, we're getting somewhere. But as friends do, they press on. See, most of us will take that and say, okay, God's going with me. Let's go. But Moses presses on just like we do with our friends when, when uh, one of my students who's now grown up, who's in this room right now, first came to me and said, Mr. Eddie, I have a boyfriend. I said, what's his name? And she told me. I said, where's he from? And she told me. I said, what do his parents do? And she told me. I said, what does he look like? And she told me. What are his grades like? And she told me. You keep pressing. Why? Because we're friends. I have a boyfriend. Okay, great. I could have left it at that, but mm, I need to know more. I need to know more. So, like a friend, Moses says to God, if your presence does not go with us, then do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? And then this next line hit me like a ton of bricks. It says, what else will distinguish me and your people from all of the other people on the face of the earth? And it hit me like a ton of bricks because I realized that the only thing that makes me different then everybody else out there is the presence of God. The only thing that makes us different from everybody else out there making noise is the presence of God. The only thing that makes us different from anyone else out there touting their faith at the top of their lungs is the presence of God. And if you are not in the presence of God, you're just like everybody else. There are those with him, and there are those that ain't. That's it. That's the line. And Moses, before it was written that the, 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 the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy, before that was ever written, Moses understood something that I'm still figuring out today. That more important than his promise, because he was sending them into the promised land. More important than his promise. More important than his power, he was sending an angel before them to wipe out all the ites and clear the way. And you know what happens when one angel shows up in the Bible. Angels have slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people. God had to stop the angel from destroying Jerusalem because at the spread of his hand to destroy Jerusalem, God says, stop. We know what angels are capable of. For some messengers, they are like heaven's green berets. He said, more than your promise, more than your power, I want your presence. And I realized that I am guilty of praying for God's promise. I am guilty of praying for God's power. But do I love him enough to call him just for his presence? Do I want a relationship like Moses that understands that the most important thing is the presence of God? I'll give you an example. When I first was going through my divorce, I moved into an apartment. 
shared this with you a while ago. I moved to an apartment that my first girlfriend in Arizona lived in, same apartment complex. And I was like, God, I, I went back 20 years. I took a step 20 years backwards. I'm now at the same place I started at. And I'm in this nice refurbished two-bedroom apartment. Uh, me and my kids, there's plenty of room for us. Got a kitchen, got a living room, got washing machine, dry. It's nice. It's even on the first floor. My kids were four and two. It's nice. The first night my kids were in there, I put them to bed in my room. They wanted to sleep in the room with me. We're in a new place. I put them down to go to sleep, and I got up, and I went to the living room, and I started weeping because of where I found myself. I called my mother and was expressing my feelings to her, and I'll never forget what she said. She said, boy, don't you understand that home is where you are? You're their father. They love just being with you. Home is wherever you are. And I take that statement and liken it today. So let me, let me bring, it, bring it all the way forward for you. What if God were to come, the second coming happens, he takes us up in the clouds, we go to heaven, the gates open, all the angels are there, and he says, look, there's the streets of gold, there's paradise, there's everything you could ever want. Have fun, I'm out of here. Would it still be heaven? How come we know that that's not heaven if he's not there, but I'm here on earth and I don't invite his presence into my life? I don't pray for his presence. How can we have heaven here on earth? Because heaven is where God is. And if I'm in his presence, I'm already in heaven. Moses understood that. The most important thing for us as Christians is to be in the presence of God. And like when the angel of the Lord came down to Joshua, don't ask the wrong question. Are you with me? Are you friend or foe? That is the wrong question. The question is, are we with him? I'm not praying, God, come be with me. I'm praying, God, take me to where you are. Moses prayed, teach me your ways. He didn't say, listen to my opinion. He didn't say, listen to my politics. He didn't say, listen to my cultural understanding. He said, teach me your ways. He understood before it was ever written that it's all about him. It's all about Christ. It's all about God. And I would rather die in the presence of God than go to paradise without him. You understand the statement that Moses is making here? Don't send me to paradise and you ain't coming. If I'm going to get in trouble, I'm going to get in trouble right here in your presence. But you're not sending me to paradise without you. You're not sending me to your promise without you. You haven't told me you were going. In the beginning, I wanted somebody else to go with me because I was scared. We have grown, Lord. I only need you. And if you ain't going, I ain't going. We find ourselves in positions sometimes where we're fighting battles where God isn't. I heard a song this morning. It's one of my favorite songs. It's called Be Still and Know That I Am God by Travis Green. And he starts off singing the song about everybody's running to and fro to go to places where God is not there. Why are you running to this and that? Because CNN, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, 1, 2, 3, whatever it is, told you to go do it. I don't answer to them. I answer to him. He determines my path. He determines my way. He determines my life. And I will not go to paradise. I will not go to his promise. I will not go uh, uh, revel in his power without him. God said, I'm sending an angel. And Moses said, that ain't enough. I want you. If you're not going, I'm not going. Simple as that. You're going to have to put me there yourself, God, because I'm not leaving your side. I got a kid like that. My daughter. If I'm sitting down on the couch, 
she's up under my right wing. I can't tell you as a man sometimes how unnerving that is. Because I will look, I'll be sitting there and I have just my hand down and she will come, lift my hand and put it around her. So my favorite thing to do is resist her moving my hand. And she'll look at me, Dad, put your arm around me. I don't want to touch anybody right now. I don't care, Dad. That's what she'll tell me. I'm your daughter. Imagine having that relationship with God. Hey, son, go over there. Okay, come on, Dad. Oh, no, I'm not going. Then I'm not going. I'm going to stay right on your toes. I'm going to stay right on your feet. I'm going to be up in your garments. You just put me in your pocket. We go or I don't go. So now, what does this have to do with religious liberty? I'm so glad you asked. Let's discuss it. I was looking at something from one of our religious liberty leaders from the conference, and because so much of this that's out there is run by the devil and meant to divide us, he gave a seven-point guideline for our churches, and I liked it. I'm not going to go into it a whole lot, but I do want to hit some of these points. Point number one. We have in this country the right to vote. Some places don't. Some places the vote is coerced. But in this country, we have the right to vote. So when I vote, I vote with virtue. Virtue. And what I mean by that is, Adventists should look at the motive of which they vote. Is it a virtue for that which is good or are there ulterior motives? I'm not voting for self. I'm not voting for retirement, security, financial prosperity, identity justice, or anything based on self-preservation. I'm voting for virtue because my God is a virtuous God. That's how I vote. Number two, and, and, and we need more of this. And I'm just going to call it out. We need more of this across the world. But the world is where I need to go speak. You're my family. So I'm going to tell you this. Voting is private and personal. Okay? It's private. It's personal. Let it be so. Do not involve or engage yourself in divisive conversations, in divisive topics, and start picking sides based on who is most like you. Don't do that. Leave it private. Leave it personal. Your view of the world is going to be different than mine. We have different experiences. The things that you get animated about may not be the things that animate me. They may be simple to me. They may be a big deal to you. I don't need you to come to my side to make me feel better about who I am. I'm big enough to have you come and say, I disagree with you. And I say, OK, you want to go get lunch? Because we're still friends. I'm okay that you disagree. We have that right. I'm okay with that. Let's go get some food, though. Food always makes things better. Number three, avoid voting along party lines. Because sometimes our parties, if you've ever been to a good party, you know that it may start off good, but only takes is one person to make it get obnoxious. Do it all. You vote with God. And if God is over there today and he's over there tomorrow, or he's over there on this subject, but he's over there on that subject, and that's the way God is telling you to vote, but it's personal and private to you. I don't got to tell everybody what I did or if I did it. Well, I vote with God. There's no donkey or elephant that's my leader. I serve a higher authority. I'm a child of the Most High God. I ask him what I should do, and then I keep it between us, because that's my friend, and I don't want to share his business. Number four, and we got to stop this. Avoid political questions. I hear this way too much. So what are your feelings on the wall? It's sturdy. I don't know. What do you want me to say? It's big. 
I'm not about to engage in that stuff. I'm not about to. Because no matter what I say, feel, or think, that's how I feel or think. I'm not about to call somebody to walk away from Christ or walk away from something that ha- may come out of my mouth that's meant for them from God because I have engaged in divisive conversation. You're my family. I got all walks of life in this building. I've already told you I'm a hard person to love. And I'm a hard person to love because I love hard back. So now, I love that I can go to this place and I see faces and friends all over the place. I love that I can go to Yuma, I can go to Holbrook, I can go to Payson, I can go to Prescott Valley, Flagstaff, I can go to Sholo, and I find friends everywhere. I don't want anything to divide my family. I don't engage in it. I won't engage in it. I almost walked out on a meeting this month because it was brought up. And I couldn't believe that I got pulled out of Glenview Academy, where I get to share the love of God every day, to hear that. I didn't want it. I don't want to engage in anything that separates me from my family. And you're my family. Number six, number five, we vote from an Adventist framework. I have one world view. It's his. My view on the state of the dead, him. My view on life, him. I don't care what nationality, color I am. I vote with, from one world view, his view. I do what he tells me to do. Number six, if I'm going to get involved with anything, I'm going to do it remaining an Adventist Christian under the rulership of Jesus Christ. And if anything that I get involved with starts to sway from what my God wants me to do, I am out. I don't join a throng just because I need to join a throng. I'm a gang all by myself. I don't need to join up just because I want to be in the in crowd. I've been looking weird since the day I was born. I was born with a unibrow, big feet, and long arms. I've never been on the in crowd, but I'm with his crowd. I will do as he commands me to do and not engage in the rest of the foolishness. And lastly, lastly, I have to rely on my sacred faith. God has put our faith, our people on this world at this time for such a time as this. I will not leave the station that he has assigned me to go join the in crowd, or because you think like I do. I can tell you firsthand that the way I think isn't always the best. I don't always have right answers. That's why I have friends who think differently than I do to help me keep my course, or else I can easily go off the deep end. And that's real deep because I'm tall. I need people around me to help keep me focused on God and what he has called us to do. If I deviate from what he has called us to do, I have left the mission that he has assigned to me. I can't be worried about some of the nonsense they want us to worry about when I got people on Lamar who need Jesus right outside my door. When I got neighbors who are dying left and right because they don't know Jesus. When I have an entire church on a Native American reservation that is still dealing with the COVID epidemic. And it's still killing them. And I got to get there to teach them about Jesus. And I got to pray that help comes our way. I'm with him. I'm with him. And no matter what we feel, no matter what we think, no matter what we think we've been through, What does God say? And am I with him? Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. I can find happiness in some of the ugliest places, as long as he's with me. I can find joy in some of the most difficult situations, as long as he's with me. And what him being with me is determined by (laughs) is am I following him? I go where he goes, I do what he does, I say what he says. Isn't that what Jesus said? I only do as the Father does, and I only say 
as the Father says. So why is it that we think we're better than Jesus and can say and do differently than what Jesus did? Our whole faith is built on Jesus as our focal point. And yet we let everything out there pull us to do something different. I'm imploring you today to let nothing divide my family. and You are my family. Don't let anything break us apart. Don't let anything come in here and tear us up. I talked to one of my mentors, and I'm going to end with this. We were discussing religious liberty. I didn't want to bring this up. I wanted to preach something totally different, and he gave me some, a statement, and I love it. So I tweaked it a little. I'm going to read it to you. Religious liberty is not about what is happening in the world. It is about God. It is about who you want to worship, how you want to worship, and when you want to worship. And the one who gave us the right to choose chose us before the foundation of the world. That, that is religious liberty. It doesn't make a difference if BLM is marching, the Proud Boys, or KKK is marching. God has it. He already knew it. He is above the world. This, that is what religious liberty is about. I'm tired of it being about what is going to happen to us. We already know what's going to happen. It's prophetic. It's been written about. It must happen. I personally can't wait. For too long, we have had religious liberty focused on what is going to be done to us. I am a child of the Most High God and servant to the King of Kings. It's time for the world to be worried about what I'm going to do to it. Am I not the salt of the world? Am I not the salt of the earth? You should be worried about what flavor I'm bringing. That's what religious liberty is to me. Stop being worried about what you're going to do. You should be worried. The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That means the church was attacking the gates. Let's get to work. and Let's be salty. It's time for the world to see what flavor we're bringing. Personally, I'm carne asada flavor. That's me. I don't know what flavor you bring in, but I'm carne asada flavor with a little touch of chipotle. Y'all going to get this seasoning today. Y'all going to get this seasoning today. It's time for us to go out there and do our job and let them fear the children of God coming. I want them shaking in their boots like they did in Jericho. For 40 years, they were saying, Yahweh and his children are coming. The world no longer fears the children of God. We've lost our flavor. Come to my barbecue. Let's get salty. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you have shown us what the beautiful relationship between you and your son looks like. Moses, who started off with every excuse in the book, didn't want to do the job wound up understanding something so important that the most important thing is being in your presence. Even paradise means nothing without you. And God, we stand here on a day where we are observing religious liberty and all that's happening in the world. Sometimes we stand around in our rooms, in our minds, in our houses, worried about what's going to happen to us when in fact... The world should be doing exactly what we're doing, worrying about those Christians that are coming with a light that we can't stop, with a light that the darkness cannot overcome. Those Christians are upholding Jesus everywhere they go, and we can't do anything about it. They should be worried about us. So, Father, I'm calling on you today. Help us in our conversations in our journey here as American citizens, help us to understand that the most important thing is being in your presence. And you will guide us everywhere, every step, and through everything as long as we stick with you. Lord, bless us today with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.